welcome back to the Council Gardener. And spring's blooming up here at Hazelhead Park, you can tell by that lovely crocuses. And this month we'll be learning how to prune roses correctly, the do's and the don'ts, and learning about fertiliser, a little bit of science in there. Rose pruning. It's a really tricky situation for a lot of gardeners out there. But I'm going to be showing you some tips and techniques to help relieve the stress. And there's no better place to learn it than Hazelhead Park at the Queen Mother Memorial Rose Garden. It's the right time of year, now the cold snap's gone, to get in and remove last year's growth to promote beautiful lovely roses again for this summer. And what you're going to need is a pair of gloves and a sharp clean pair of secateurs. Clean in the fact that you don't want to transfer disease from rose to rose. So remember to use an alcohol wipe to clean your secateur blade. So now you've got your PPE and your equipment sorted, the first thing's first. You're identifying your rose. And if you're a regular viewer of the Council Gardener, you remember I taught you how to identify the rose last year. And this is a Floribunda rose. Remember, they're a Floribunda because they've got lots of stems, which means there's more little flowers. Different to the hybrid tea with one strong single flower usually. And then once you've identified the rose, you'll know how to prune it. And the first thing with pruning, no matter what plant it is or other shrubs, you always look for the three Ds, which are dead, diseased and dying. So once you've removed your three Ds, you look for intercrossing or rubbing stems because what they're doing is they're actually working against each other for space and time. So you remove them first. And then once you've done all of this, you then start to prune the rose. You're going to actually want to prune this less severe than the other ones because they want to have a bush effect or a patio style shrub rose as they're called. They want it to be a chalice or a vase shape so it's clear in the centre and it's all around the outside. This is to promote aeration inside to it to stop it from getting disease and die back. So now you've got your clean pair of set of tears and you're ready to prune. And what you're going to do is you're going to actually look for the buds. So from this nod here you can see there's one bud there already and if you go down there's one coming from the sides here, two, three. So what I'm going to do, you want the strongest stems kept as well, even with the Floribunda, and I'm going to cut it about a quarter of an inch above the bud in a 45 degree angle away from the bud. This is so the water runs away from the bud and doesn't rot it. So you want as much strong buds as you can to promote as much stems and good flower throughout the year. But remember, you've got to always keep the chalice shape to let the aeration in, but to give a good show and form of the shrub. I'm going to also remove this little stem, it's here, because it's just going to take up energy from the rose and not to the stronger stem. I'm also going to remove this stem here, and then I'm going to keep with an outward facing bud, quarter of an inch, 45 degree angle there. And this is what it's going to look like when it's finished. About one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stems left on the Floribunda, all strong stems with outward facing buds cut with a 45 degree angle in the chalice shape. If you can see it there, they're all around the inside. There's a gap in the middle to let aeration through and they're all going to shoot strong stems to create that chalice. So you want your rose to look like this. That's the best pruned part rose in the whole of Aberdeen City Council. So now I've shown you how to prune a Floribunda rose, I'm going to show you the other rose, the hybrid tea. So this is a hybrid tea rose with a three to four strong stems that produce singular flowers but larger than the Floribunda that we pruned earlier. And what's good about a hybrid tea is that you can see the buds a bit more clearer because of its less stems to deal with. And you can actually see here, there's a bud there really shooting out and then another bud here, another bud here. So you're going to prune this a bit lower down than you did the Floribunda and if you can tell by here, you've got one bud, two buds, three buds. So I'm going to cut a 45 degree angle away from that, about a quarter of an inch above. You're going to prune this down a little bit more harsher because you're wanting it to rejuvenate from the bottom and produce that one strong stem rather than pushing it right across all the stems that you leave. Because there's less stems and lower down. So it's three to four buds in the same cut with a 45 degree angle, quarter of an inch above the bud to produce, to make the water move so it doesn't rot the bud out. So once you've done that with the first stem, you just repeat the process with the rest. The only difference is, if you do have a fourth stem, but it isn't as strong as the other two, and it's in an awkward position, you can remove that stem completely by cutting it at the base. So once you've done that with the first stem, you just repeat the process with the rest. And if you follow the simple steps, you'll have a beautiful rose this summer. And hopefully, you don't have as many roses to prune as here in Hazel Head, but you've just got enough to keep you happy at home.
So welcome to the Hazelhead Grove Nursery. Today we'll be talking about fertilising and the basics for every single gardener. Fertilising. People think it's just what farmers do, but it's really important in the garden because it's all about nutrients for your plant to grow. And it sh studies suggest that almost two thirds of gardeners don't fertilise their garden, which is terrible because the plants aren't getting the nutrients they need. And I think the real issue with fertilising and the problem is that people think the knowledge is too far advanced or it's just too complex. And today I'm going to break it down and make it as basic as possible so that you have the idea and the knowledge to use fertilising in the future going forward. Because what I also hear all the time is, I grew potatoes there, I grew this la there last year and it doesn't do so well this year. And that's because the plants used up all the nutrients and then you haven't reinvested that back into the garden. And it's something that's key to making the best use of your plants year by year. Now for the science bit. You don't need any of this to learn about fertilising. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know about the gardening sciences. So the elements that plants need from nature that are provided for them are oxygen, which is in the air around us, also in water. Hydrogen, which comes from the rain, water. So they're dealt with by nature itself. So the next elements that the gardeners are going to provide are the holy trinity of elements, the N, P and K. N is for nitrogen. Nitrogen is to help promote the green growth of the leaves, which helps the plant to make foods. P is for phosphorus, which helps support the roots and the stems and produce great flowers and seeds. And the K is for potassium, which helps the roots and fight off diseases, promoting healthier growth. So when you are buying your fertilizer, always make sure that you check the actual volumes of the N, P and K, because that's what you're buying the fertilizer for, to increase the growth of certain aspects of the plant. And on some packets, they won't even mark it out on it because the, you are supposed to know that that's what it is. So if you look here, this is what this number symbolizes: the N, the P, and the K. So this is going to be one part nitrogen, zero parts phosphorus, and one part potassium. So now I've taught you the basics of the elements that are involved, and now you're going to be selecting what type of fertilizer you're going to buy. And there is only two choices there, organic or synthetic. Now as a horticulturist, I'm going to give you my reason why I only choose one and that is organic. It's because you want to be natural to the environment that you're working in. And although synthetic is cheaper, it's quicker releasing, and it is actually longer lasting, the problem with synthetic is that if you use that, it actually kills some of the microorganisms in the soil that you're trying to promote. Where organic is slower releasing and has a lot of micro bodies involved with it, it will be naturally efficient for your plant. So that's my choice, but it's up to yourself as well. So now you've got different options to choose from of how you're gonna applicate it onto your plants. So this is granular. This comes in both organic and synthetic. And what it is, is it's just a powdery sort of grainy sort of material that you're gonna pour around the base of the plant, not to touch the stems or the flowers or the leaves because it'll burn. And you just pour it around your plant and then water it in. And this is longer lasting. It is quite effective, quite fast and effective, but not as some of the others, but you'll see that further down the line. The second option that you can use that's even longer than this, but it's a slower release, so you're not gonna get the instant impact, but I quite like to use it because you can use it from even early on when you're potting your plants on, is pellets. And these come in little small pellets like this, see them there, and these come in six months, 12 months, 18 months. And what it is, is it's a little ball that's got layers, and one layer will slowly dissolve into the soil, producing nutrients, over a six month period, then the next layer over a six month period, and then the next layer. These are really, really good, and I use them quite often because you can put them in the soil when you're even potting up originally. Because it isn't a quick release of the nutrients to give the plant a shock, it slowly feeds it and gives it that care and need over a longer period. And then your third option, which is very fast acting, but the problem with this is, because it's so quick acting, you have to use it more regularly, is water soluble. Now water soluble is just a liquid that comes in bottles, and you're going to have to dilute it in water and feed it to your plant. But like I said, it becomes a more of a frequent use because it's so fast acting and so quick using, so you're going to be using that more often. And the fourth option that isn't in front of me just now, but we've covered it before in the Council Gardener, is mulching, which is using organic material to naturally produce the nutrients back into the soil. And like I said before, you use your compost in, once it's composted, it turns into mulch that you can then top up your soil with. And it's got other great aspects to it. It's a weed repellent. It's adding it in naturally and a slow release in microbiologically as well. So it's a great option to use. So now that you've gained the general knowledge, you've know the elements, you know the choices you have to make, it's your decision as a gardener on how you feed your plants. But I assure you, do feed your plants because you wouldn't not feed yourself. So that's been it for the first episode of the Council of Gardener for 2019 for March. And also it's great to be back. 
but for some of that eagle-eyed viewers out there, you might have noticed the new badge, and this is Project Craster. And you'll learn more about this bear and his friend Bella the Bee, and a lot more about flowers in the next few months. So remember, gardening's all about growing, so let's grow together. Mm -hmm.